Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, as always, and today is a new monthly segment on the show called Road to 2023, where we're going to be talking the last Wednesday of each month about the 2023 provincial election here in the province of Alberta. Now, you might be asking yourself, why the hell are we talking about the provincial election in January of 2022? Well, that's the reason. This is the last full calendar year of politics for the provincial uh, before the provincial election in 2023. So each month at the end of the month, we're going to be bringing in pundits, uh, candidates, uh, pollsters. We're going to be bringing everyone to talk about the upcoming provincial election, where the party stand and where the party needs to go. Uh, for our inaugural monthly segment, we are bringing in the host of the Dave Berta podcast. The I, I, I don't want to, I'm not sure if I should call you editor in chief of Dave Berta website uh, blog, uh, Mr. Dave Kanye. Dave, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me, inviting me on the podcast, Chris. This is great. <laughs> this is going to be fun. This is going to be a fun next uh, 30 to 40 minutes talking about provincial politics. I guess the first thing we need to sort of talk about, because it literally came out at about four o'clock yesterday as of recording this, and his uh, demotion came today, was is Casey Maddu. Casey Maddu, uh, PC MLA for Edmonton Southwest, I want Edmonton to say. Edmonton Southwest. Southwest. Yeah. Um, was revealed via CBC article that he was driving distracted texting in a school zone in Edmonton. He called the Alberta, uh, sorry, the Edmonton police chief shortly after that. And it was, came out yesterday. What is this, for, from your perspective, for someone who's covered politics as long as you have, have you ever seen something like this? Like it, it doesn't even seem like Ralph Klein would have done this. It's it's very bizarre. And I mean, the key, the key point is that Casey Madu is the uh, Minister of Justice and Solicitor General for the province of Alberta. So he's kind of the he's the well, he's the top enforcement he, officer. It, yeah, well, not really. I mean, he's the he's the, he's the minister in charge of, of justice and and uh, and the uh, and kind of the, the police system. Um, I know sometimes Edmonton's are uh, post media columnist. I know Rick Bell sometimes refers to him as the top cop, but he's not really the top cop. But but being Minister of Justice and essentially being Attorney General and Solicitor General, it's a big, it's a it's a very important position within the government, a very powerful position within the provincial government. So um, the <laughs> that this all played out how it did is incredibly bizarre and, and very very puzzling because I don't know if if uh, I, I don't know how many other justice ministers will would have done this and i mean as you you laid it out right is uh you know I, what we know is that the the minister this was 10 months ago this happened um was pulled over and issued a distracted driving ticket for being distracted or driving distracted Texting in, while driving or something in in a school zone in 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 edmonton so at some point soon after he called the uh the uh, the chief of police in in edmonton dale mcphee um, now, both of both Chief McPhee and and uh, and Mr. Madu um, have admitted that the phone call happened. What you know, what was discussed? It's, it seems to be a bit of a of a, a little bit contentious. I mean, Madu says he didn't actually raise the uh, you know ra ask for the ticket to be rescinded. Um, he said he was raising issues of racial profiling and wondering if. Uh, if he was the subject of a, uh, a police profiling. profiling or whether, whether it be racial or whether it be, whether, whether it be politically motivated, something he, he suggested, he said something similar, uh, something similar to what was happening or what, what happened to, uh, to Lethbridge West MLA, Shannon Phillips in, in Lethbridge, where she was being spied on and tracked uh, by the, uh, by the police service there when she was a, a min uh, minister of environments and park environment and parks. Um, but McPhee also came out in the CBC article that came out literally as the news broke that mm -hmm. Casey Madu, the attorney general, had not asked him to rescind the uh, the uh, ticket as well. So both of them are saying they did not ask or did not request for the ticket to be rescinded, but it's still the optics, right? The optics yeah, of calling the person you're kind of in charge of, the the legal realm of Alberta politics to say, Let's talk about this as I just get this random ticket. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, there's, 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 you cannot, no, cannot not mention the power dynamic that goes on there when the minister of justice picks up the phone and calls the chief of police to raise this issue. Um, I think that's, I think it was, 
completely inappropriate. I mean, I, I completely inappropriate and, 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 and absolutely a, a firing offense. And I was surprised to see that the premier, uh, you know, he removed Casey Madu or Casey Madu is stepping back as justice minister. But from what I understand, he still remains justice minister. And that Sonia Savage, who's also the energy minister, uh, is now also acting as justice minister and solicitor general. And there'll be um, an investigation, an investigator appointed, though I don't know what the, the I don't know what the investigator is going to uh, investigate, because the only thing that the that it seems that the police chief and Mr. Madhu disagree on is whether the ticket was valid or not, whether the fine was valid or not. Madhu says he wasn't, you know, that he that he it was he, in his pocket, <laughs> that his phone was in his pocket. And obviously the police officer disagreed. Uh, and the chief of police said the ticket was valid. So is that what they're going to investigate? Because that seems very bizarre. Um, so I do wonder about whether whether we're we're you know we're looking at at you know potentially this is a setup for a cabinet shuffle happening in the next couple of weeks, going ahead into the into the spring session. We're now entering the red zone. I mean, you're you're launching this feature series on on the 2023 election. We are entering the what they what they call the red zone. Is is now politicians are in this province are really starting to think about the provincial election. Really starting to think about individually about whether they're going to run whether or not they're going to run for re-election what that looks like and generally at this point what happens is the premier's office will start looking at cabinet ministers and looking at the caucus and say well you know shaking things up is usually you know we want to have a fresh face going into the next election there's going to they're going to be talking to cabinet ministers going to be asking you know cabinet ministers just exactly to start making those decisions are you running for re-election or not and you know in some cases if they're not running for re-election there's a good chance they could be, you know, asked to leave the cabinet in the, in the last year and there'll be new backbench MLAs, you know, including some of the, maybe some of the parliamentary secretaries, their associate ministers who they've been grooming to, to fill those roles. Or that's traditionally what they do is use those, uh, those positions to kind of, kind of train cabinet ministers in waiting. Now, this isn't the only party that's having some issues with the police right now. The NDP also, in Dece on December 21st, uh, Rachel Notley held a uh, surprise press conference that Thomas Yang, the uh, Edmonton MLA as well, uh, would be resigning from caucus and sitting as an independent M MLA because of his... Uh, because of a, a search warrant that was conducted on his house by the Alberta uh, RCMP. Um, can the NDP use the Casey Madu uh, issue to their advantage, or do they sort of have to step back because their party is also in the same situation where they have an MLA under investigation by the RCMP, something's going on, not to the same extent, but they're also a party that has some issues going on with their MLAs with being involved with the police. Well, I mean, I think the situations are 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 very different because Casey Medu was issued, I mean, it's, it's a traffic violation. He was yeah. issued a, a traffic fine. Um, and then the issue isn't, isn't the, I mean, I guess it depends if you're, I guess part of the issue is whether, whether the fine was valid or Casey yeah. Medu wants that to be part of the issue, which is very bizarre. Um, but the issue is more, did he use his, in, was, was he trying to use his influence as, as minister of justice to, yeah, you know, to get out of the tick, get out of the fine or whatever. Um, or was, was he abusing his position? Um, the Thomas Dang situation is a little different because he's not actually, he hasn't actually been charged with anything. We're not actually sure what the RCMP are investigating. Um, we, I mean, it's a very bizarre situation. It was very strange to have that kind of pre-Christmas press conference all of a sudden with, you know, Rachel Notley announcing that, uh, that Thomas Dang had left the, the NDP caucus and then to hang issuing a statement on, on online um, that he was going to sit as an independent. Um, we, the NDP believe it had to do something with a, with a privacy violation or uh, hacking and uh, maybe potential inappropriate access of, a, of uh, to Alberta health information, COVID information records. Um, so I don't actually know where, where, where that stands, but I think the, what they wanted, what they meant to do or what they, what they, they tried to demonstrate by um, by Thomas Dang becoming an independent MLA is that they were, you know, they were doing the responsible thing. So I think that if they hadn't, if there had been, you know, if, if it had gone down how it did with the RCMP search warrant and Thomas Dang had remained in the NDP caucus, I think what they were worried about is that they would basically be open to, open to criticism. Um, so this is their way of showing that, you know, not that they're beyond reproach, but they're, 
you know, they're, they're doing it the way that, the way that you should, that if an MLA is under, under any kind of investigation that they should be, you know, they should sit as an independent until it's, until that is resolved. So I think they're kind of, I, I don't think any kind of attack would really stick. I mean, partisan, well, will make partisan attacks, but was the UCP caucus was kind of silent when the Thomas Dang uh, issue sort of came up. Uh, the Albert NDP, I, I saw Irfan Sabir's uh, comments, Kathleen Ganley's comments after the CDC article came out. Um, so it is, I, I understand where you're coming from, where this was him trying to peddle his influence to talk to the potential, say, hey, maybe. This was a <laughs> and exactly, right? There's an That's what it looks like. <laughs> independent, air quotes there for those who are listening to this via podcast, independent investigation uh, will come out and s- hopefully settle this and figure out what's going on. Um, so we, we've taken up too much time on that. I, I want to turn to 2023. Sure. We are 16 months because hypothetically there's going to be an election before May of next year. So 16 months until the next election. Where are the parties at right now? And that's the big question because we see one party who is nominating candidates left, right, and center across the board. Uh, the NDP. And we'll start with them because they are leading in the polls as much as you can try to believe in what polls say. They're leading the polls. What does the NDP need to do in the next 12 months to continue this momentum that they are seeing in the polls and translate that into votes? Because I know and you know, you don't believe polls until election day, because if that's the case, we would have a liberal majority in Ottawa when the election was called in September of last year or August of last year. So what does the NDP, Alberta NDP, need to do to continue that momentum that they've been building on for the last four years? Sure. Well, well first, first, looking at the next election, um, the, the UCP passed legislation in the fall uh, and they got rid of the fixed, this didn't get a lot of media attention, but they got rid of the fixed election window that we had. Yeah. So they've set the next date for the next provincial election to uh, May 29th, 2023 is when, it, when it's been set. Uh, I think that was Bill 81 or Bill 82 that was passed. It included a whole bunch of other stuff, but it also included an actual fixed election date. But because of all the other stuff, this didn't actually get, didn't actually get it. <laughs> Almost no attention. I think I, I wrote about it and I think Graham Thompson wrote about it for one of his CBC or iPolitics columns. Um, and then on polls, I think it's important to like, don't not believe polls, but but understand that polls are snapshots of where, of of a, a sample of of uh, people's opinions at any given moment. So, a poll that's taken today is how people feel or how they're saying they feel today, or uh, last week, depending or on last the week <laughs> if, if 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 the poll was taken. But it's not necessarily how they're going to act a year from now or sixteen months from now. Um, so polls can be, I mean, polls can be can be important for tracking trends um, in terms of seeing where where voters are, and they can also. And this is the other, this is the kind of the more political thing is they're also really uh, really useful at crafting narratives and really really influential influential at crafting narratives. So one of the things that's really crafted that helped craft the narrative of Alberta politics in January 2022 is that the NDP have been leading in the polls since November 2020. Um, and that's a huge change from the previous, basically the previous three or four years from when the UCP had had formed um, or had was founded between the merger of the PCs and the Wild Rose. So polls can be used to create as powerful tools to create political narratives. And you can look at other examples like Nenshi, for example, and um, in, in many of his campaigns uh, around uh, around craft, crafting crafting political narratives and and getting the attention of political columnists and political commentators and creating buzz. Um, so, okay, now what, what, what does the NDP need to do before the next election? Well, obviously they need to do, they need to maintain this level of support and, and, uh, and maintain their fundraising and attract candidates and, and hit on the issues that, 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 that they've been hitting on. I think they've been pretty successful with their focus on, you know, it, it in some ways politically, it, it, it helps that we've all been focused and all been talking about healthcare over the past two years because healthcare has always been an issue that where the NDP are stronger than the UCP on. Um, you know, we haven't been talking about the economy. We haven't been talking about pipelines. We haven't really been talking about jobs. All these things, you know, the pipe, jobs, economy, pipelines, the things that, you know, the three slogan, the three, the three um, uh, buzzwords that the UCP had on, on all their literature in the, in the last provincial election. Um, so, so that has that has definitely definitely helped uh, help the NDP, and it's interesting to see them start off really strong with their nominations. One of the big criticisms that that uh, 
political pundits and conservatives really hammered the NDP with ahead of the 2019 election is that they didn't really have a lot of contested nominations. They had a few contested nominations, candidate nominations ahead of 2019. There were a ha handful, maybe five or six across the province. We're talking 87 ridings. Most, most incumbents were, uh, were renominated if they decided to run. Most, most candidates were, were acclaimed. Um, this time it's, it's looking a little different. And I think, that's, I think it's probably on purpose. They're trying to create uh, a sense of momentum. So you have, they've opened up early nominations in a number of ridings that we all expect to be, anyone who's watching Alberta politics ahead of the next election expect to be uh, expect to be interesting writing. So we have Lethbridge East, for example, uh, which which was formerly held by by the NDP, um, has Calgary been liberal Curry. in the past. Calgary Curry, Banff Kananaskis is one that uh, that they haven't set the nomination date yet, but that looks like it will be a very interesting one and could be def definitely um, a potential pickup for the NDP if it looks like they're going to form government. So there's writings like this where where there are. Um, uh, you know, there, there is more contested. I think we'll see some contested races up in Northeast Calgary where the, where the NDP are, seem to be really focusing their resources and see it as a, see that area as a real opportunity to make gains in the, in the next election. So I, I, I want think to there's pick a, your brain for about something that sure. you just said there, because uh, Calgary, Curry and Lethbridge East were formerly held by Maria Fitzpatrick and uh, Brian Nelkinson. Both of them mm -hmm. ran for the nomination and both of them lost. Mm -hmm. Does that say something about the new NDP that we are seeing the, the transition to a new a sort of, uh, Re, re energized because you would think because a name recognized candidate like a Marie Fitzpatrick, like a Brian Malkinson would be easy to potentially pick up those seats. And this is, this is my criticism and this is my criticism. Anyone who knows my husband knows who he is uh, and knows that this is Chris Brown talking and not him. Um, does the NDP need to refresh their brand to say, okay, out with the old in with the new, these are the new candidates. These are who we are. And this is the sort of the new and improved NDP that, wasn't in power in 2015 to 2019 or am i just thinking way too much into that oh i mean i think there's i think there's 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 uh there is an element of that i think in those two races uh at least in lethbridge lethbridge east i think that i mean rob miyashiro who won is a popular former city councillor um has a lot of name recognition it was there were two or three other candidates in that race um so i, I don't know if i'd read that far into it i definitely do think the ndp are trying to position themselves and I think that they intentionally did them did this to the did this over the past, over the four years they were in government is they they're trying to position themselves as more moderate as more centrist they're the liberal party of Alberta essentially um or, or at least don't tell Rachel Notley or that. at least or at least the I like to I like to joke around that Rachel Notley was the best progressive conservative premier that Alberta's had since had since Peter Lougheed um you know so I mean they intentionally tried to position themselves to build that kind of voter coalition because I mean, Rachel Notley is a smart person. She understands that, you know, the they, the NDP did not win in 2015 uh, because of the voters they they had that voted for them in 2012 and 20, in 2008. Obviously, those people voted for the NDP. A lot of those people will have voted for the NDP anyway. But this brand new voter coalition that the NDP created, that was created out of the 2015 election, and that in some cases, the NDP sustained pretty well uh, in the 2019 election. I mean, obviously, they lost they lost a lot of seats. But overall... Um, you know, they didn't do as badly as as you would have thought, considering um, you know some of some of the some of the political coverage or even some of the polls that we saw going into the, the 2019 election. They held on to 24 seats across the province, most of them in Edmonton, um, but that gives them a good base of a good base to uh, uh, to go into the next election. Obviously, there's there's a lot of challenges. Um, the 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 electoral map is difficult for the NDP. And in some ways, it's easier for the UCP because there are so many what I would consider safe UCP seats in rural areas and, and some of the kind of mid-sized or smaller communities in, in Alberta, like Red Deer or Grand Prairie, even Medicine Hat with the way the boundaries are redrawn, that they're going to be very difficult, I think, for the NDP to win in the next election. So they're riding high in the polls. They're, you know, they're anywhere between 40 and 50. Some, some polls may even put them just over 50% of the vote. It's by no means a, a slam dunk going into the next election. Um, I think they're they're doing a lot of a lot of things right. They're benefiting from, uh, you know, from from Rachel a lot of Rachel Notley's strengths. They're benefiting from a lot of issues kind of naturally falling into uh, into the NDP zone into into where where people uh, you know affiliate with the NDP. And I think their messaging has been pretty good. Um, they seem to be nominating, you know, moving along, nominating candidates and getting some interest and creating some momentum uh, going into the next election. Um, but I like to say if, if Rachel Notley is there is the 
NDP's greatest asset. Jason Kenney is the NDP's second greatest asset. Um, because of I his... would have thought Brian Dean <laughs> was their second greatest asset. Well, he might <laughs> he might be their third. I don't know. We'll see how we'll see what happens in the by-election, see what happens on April 9th, right? Um uh you know, I mean, the, the Kenny's handling, the, the UCP's handling of the COVID pandemic, I mean, has been almost universally panned by Albertans. Um, I, I think I saw a poll the other day from, from Angus Reid that said, I think it was close to 75% of Albertans thought the, the Alberta government had, had, had poorly handled the, uh, the COVID pandemic. We now have, we're now in the fifth wave. There's more than a thousand people in hospital across the province. Um, you know, it's having an impact on schools, on workplaces, on communities. Um, and, you know, we, we have a provincial government that's kind of taken a, a letter rip attitude towards it. And I think that's, uh, that's, you know, we'd all hoped and I've been an opt, I've been a, a cautious optimist, optimist this entire time, you know, I, I hoped that the open for summer plan would work. I hoped that, you know, this would go away in the spring. Um, but, you know, you have a lot of voices saying a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me in this, uh, in this area, public health experts, doctors, nurses, um, you know, saying that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, this COVID isn't, you know, we may, we may be done with COVID, but COVID isn't done with us yet. And I think there was a lot of hope that um, in conservative circles that, you know, that this fifth wave wouldn't happen or that it'll just run through and then we'll, we'll achieve this, uh, this herd immunity that we're told all, a lot about and that it, uh, you know, that it'll be over by the time the next provincial election comes around. But I think the longer the pandemic drags on, uh, the worse it is for the, for the conservatives, because I think people are just unhappy with how they've how they've handled it we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show with a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews you can help continue this show for as little as three dollars a month your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership click the link in the show notes and back the show today You are the king of segues. You must host your own show because I was about <laughs> to ask you about the conservatives because Jason Kenney is heading into a very tough first quarter. He has a by-election with a candidate he did not back with Brian Jean with in Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche. Uh, he has a leadership review in April um, and a budget that hopefully he can potentially sell to the Alberta, uh, Alberta public to say, this is what we're going to be running on. I know there's going to be a budget next year, but Let's be honest, that budget will be sort of a pomp and ceremony budget where we try to sell everyone to everyone. Every every party has done that, mm -hmm. liberals, NDP. The UCP are going to be struggling for the first few months out of the gate in 2022. What do they need to do to sort of recapture that and pivot to not talking about COVID <laughs> every day as much as we all want to talk about COVID? They need to talk about the economy because that's how they're going to potentially win this, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, you can see you can see the direction that uh, that they're going in, and I think there's a bit of, I think there's a bit of like throwing out, uh, throwing stuff out and seeing what sticks at this point. But I think you can kind of see where they're going in terms of, of focusing on the economy. I mean, Jason Kenney's been, I mean, if you follow him on social media or you list follow his his uh, Facebook town halls that he has quite frequently, um, I mean, he's they're 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 talking a lot about the economy. They're talking a lot about employment, you know, unemployment dropping. They're talking about big and some of these big investments that are happening. Uh, and of course, I mean, governments, if you're in power, you get to take credit when things are good, and you get to uh, you know, and you get to take the blame when things go when things things go poorly. So I think they're really trying to shift and talk about a positive economic message trying to trying to shift people's attention i think it it um it's not easy because of jason the level of jason kenny's unpopularity right now um whether but, but, I, I, I think I, it's gonna I, be interesting to see whether he gets the that. credit or not i'm gonna Sorry, challenge go you a little bit on that sure. is it unpopular with people who are answering the polls because <laughs> You you lived through the 2012 uh, Alberta election. I, I I remember covering it back in Ontario. Uh, Alison Redford was going down in defeat. No one expected her to win, and then holy crap, she won. Christy Clark was going down in defeat in the 2011, if I'm not mistaken, election when she took over from uh, Gordon Campbell. She won. It, are we reading too much into this that he is unpopular? Because will or will people will just rally around him and say, okay? We'd rather the devil we know than the devil we don't with the NDP coming back into power. So let's just put our eggs in one basket and hopefully 
turf him in a leadership review after the election and get someone else in there to sort of do a Ed Stelmack or Allison Redford, Jim Prentice, well, <laughs> what I, the conservatives I, love to do in this province. Well, I think the first part of your of, of the first part of your analysis, pardon me, is, is is correct. I think what they're doing is, if I if I was to look in a crystal ball and 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 try to try to try to predict what they're doing is they're they're trying to create a sense of optimism um, about the economy, about jobs, so that they they can then turn around and say we don't want to we don't want to sacrifice this. If you vote NDP, this will you know all this all this good news, all these investments are going to be gone if if you vote if you vote NDP, and that's going to be that's going to be their 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 argument is vote us for good times, and these guys are just a bunch of negative nailies. Um, in in terms of of polls, uh, I mean not all polls are created equally, and that's something that's really important to remember. And I think that was a big part of the the 2012 election, even the 2015 election, is uh, you know some you have to look at methodology you have to look at you know what kind of what kind of rep, what kind of methodology are the polls using what kind of sample size are they using is it an online poll is it an ivr poll is it a you know is it a traditional tell uh, you know kind of phone poll if it is a phone poll you know are they calling back three times are they you know are they calling landlines are they calling cell phones there's all i mean it's it's not uh, it's not exact i mean some pollsters have have good reputations and some don't have fantastic reputations i mean anybody who's i'm not going to name any names but Google the Calgary mayoral election when Bill Smith and Ned and Nancy ran against each other, and you'll see how the polling worked out there. And oh, then you can I, look I at know that pollster quite well. Yeah, and then you can look at at at, at, at some other pollsters. Um, uh, I mean, I think reputationally, pollsters like Janet Brown here in Alberta have quite good reputations. I know she gets a lot of criticism from. I mean, she gets a lot of criticism from New Democrats when her polls say conservatives are good and a lot of criticism from conservatives when her polls say New Democrats are doing good. But I think she has a pretty good reputation and, and is a, you know, has a pretty good methodology um, that, that, uh, that she uses. Um, so, you know, look at the sources when it comes to polls. So going back to Jason Kenney here for a second, because that leadership mm -hmm. review will be sort of the end all be all of uh, his, his, his potential win in 2023. If he comes out of that leadership review with a large number, whether it be in person or online or however they're going to conduct this uh, leadership review, does Jason Kenney then have a, a ability to say, Brian Jean, step back, don't, don't say anything for the next 10 months until the next election? Because Brian Jean has been the thorn in his side, hasn't he? Who, who knows what's going to happen? You know, I was, I was, I've been talking to some conservatives, UCP uh, folks here in Edmonton over the past couple of weeks. And my question is, is I mean, my first question is, is what are you guys going to do when Brian Jean wins the, the by-election to Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche? Like, so he wins, and I mean the by-election has to be called by February fifteenth, and I think it has to be twenty-eight days according to Alberta election laws. So he'll be uh, he'll be an MLA, or he'll be presumably if he wins the by-election, he'll be an MLA before the leadership review on April 9th. Um, So like, what does what does the UCP do? Like, what do you what do UCP MLAs do when he shows up to their caucus meeting? Because here's a guy who's been campaigning against Jason Kenney publicly, and I mean there are a lot of UCP MLAs who feel similarly some of them have spoken out publicly some of them don't haven't spoken out publicly and have talked privately and talked amongst themselves about it and about their concerns with uh, with jason kenny's leadership and 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 what that means for the next election um but i don't think they know what to do what they're going to do with him when he wins like he won the he won the nomination race pretty handily and i mean kenny said from the beginning he said he'd respect the you know the the will of the ucp ucp membership in in fort mcmurray lac la Biche. i mean he may have been more confident that his chosen candidate was going to win when he said that but you know i mean he's kind of the king of backing himself into the corner or at least doubling down on things um or um i think i think i've, I've described it as poor expectations management in, in in some in some cases um which is kind of a surprise because he has a a, re a reputation, I think, is uh, you know, it's demonstrated as a, as a as a as a pretty skilled political organizer. Um, so I don't know what uh, I mean. I don't know what they're going to do when Brian when if when Brian Jean shows up at the UCP caucus and and uh, you know how long he'll stay in the UCP caucus, especially if Kenny wins the wins the leadership re review, which I expect he will. I mean, it's been uh, folks in the premier's office have been saying that you know kind of sixty five percent is their target. Um, for for uh, for support for Kenny at the leadership review, I think the way they've structured the uh, the leadership review of it being an in person uh, meeting in Red Deer, you know, you can you can ship kids from the local Christian college out to uh, you know on buses out to out to the meeting in Red Deer, like like he did and his campaign did when he ran for the PC leader. 
um, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, organizationally, it seems it's, it's definitely something they've definitely created a situation that would make it easy for him to win. Um, but I think Kenny will stay on if he wins 50% plus one. I think that's just the type of political beast that he is. This guy is a, a career He won't politician. pull a Ralph Klein? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think he, I think, I mean, Ralph Klein, the, 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 the shocking thing about Ralph Klein getting, was it 55.4% or 54.5% at the, the PC leadership review in 2006 or 2005 was, um, was that the previous leadership review he'd gotten 90% and that, you know, he'd been leader for so long and that he'd been so popular. So that's, I mean, that was, that was the reason why it was so shocking was the party was actively trying to push him out, but, but with Kenny, they've been actively trying to push him out for some, for some time. This is, it's kind of defined his premiership at the, at, at this point. So I, you know, I think he's going to stay on the question is, is for conservatives. And I, I haven't been able to get any, a real answer from, from anybody because they don't really know what they'll do, but I think Kenny's going to win the leadership review. So if, what if he wins and what if his popularity doesn't improve among Albertans? What if the party's position in the polls doesn't change? What if six months from after the leadership review, the NDP are still leading in the polls are still leading in fundraising and Kenny's approval rating is still down. Um, then he's demonstrated he could win an internal party fight, but that doesn't necessarily mean he can win the next election. So what does the party do at that point? And, and, you know, no one's really willing to, uh, no one is really willing to, to, uh, to answer that question because there's about 15 steps before there, but I think it, it is something interesting to think about. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. April is going to be an interesting time in politics. I think uh, Twitter is going to be a buzz depending on no matter how that vote goes on uh, April 9th in Red Deer. Um, I want to turn to the other parties because while we are in a two party system right now, two party plus three independent MLAs, we have three other parties who are trying to make uh, noise right now. We have the Alberta Party led by former Brooks Mayor Barry Morishita. We have the Liberal Party who is kind of still leaderless. They do have an interim leader, but their leadership race is going to be starting here in 2022. And the Green Party. And well, and the Wild Rose Independence Party too, I should say. And then also the Alberta Statehood Party, which just formed as, again. And then I, I, the Communist Party is there. There's, there's, there seems to be a lot of parties as well. But let's talk about the, let's talk about the four major parties. Where, where are they standing and how, how do they come out of the pack here with the Alberta Party? Because since Greg Clark, they've sort of been rudderless, even with Stephen Mandel there for a few, mm-hmm. di- a few months. Does Barry need to sort of concentrate his focus on one riding like the uh, then Green Party leader Elizabeth May did with uh, Sandwich Gulf Islands and sort of say, okay, here's where we're putting our money, we're going to win it, and then we can expand? Or do they do what Stephen Mandel does and just hope for the best and run a full slate? I, I think it's going to be very hard for, at, at this point, looking at, the, looking at the next 16 months, it's going to be very hard for a third party to really break through. Uh, I mean, this, we're in a situation where, I mean, it very much, it's, it's a solid, at this point, it's a solidified two-party race. It's, if you want to get rid of the UCP, you vote NDP. If you want to keep the NDP out, you're probably going to vote UCP. Um, that's just how the electoral math is look, is looking right now. Um, the Alberta party has been, until recently, and even, even now, I mean, it's, I think it's coming out of a bit of a dormancy um, from the last, I mean, they lost, they, they, they had, you know, they had a lot of interest they were able to elect an MLA. They had, uh, a, you know, an MLA from the PCs or the UCP, an MLA from the uh, from the NDP across the floor. They had a caucus. They had, uh, you know, a, a well-known leader in Stephen Mandel, who was the former mayor of Edmonton, former former health minister, um, and they got squeezed out. And they did pretty well. I mean, we look at the popular vote, and this is, I mean, this is such a political sciencey thing to say. When you look at the popular vote, well, popular vote doesn't really count for much. Yeah. Many seats, but they got nine percent of the popular vote, almost ten percent. So almost one in ten Albertans voted for the Alberta Party. That's not insignificant, right? That's a that's a that's a that's a good base of support to start. When the NDP were winning two seats or four seats in the legislature, they were sitting around nine, ten, twelve percent of the vote. So that's you know. For a third party, fourth party, depending on on the other parties, how many other parties there are, that's not a bad position to be in. But you still got to be able to win seats, and that's the that's the problem the Alberta Party has is how do you convince, how do you become part of the discussion, how do you become part, of, how do you get on people's minds going into into the next election? I think 
I think Barry Morishita is, uh, I think he's a good candidate. I think he's probably a, a good leader for, for the Alberta party. Um, he's got a lot of connections, was former mayor of Brooks, former president of the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. He'll know a lot of people around the province. Um, but, you know, actually being in a position to, to win a seat and to be part of the discussion is, is going to be really challenging and, and also attracting candidates. Because I think if you are, if you are a candidate who, you know, like I said, you want the NDP to lose or you want the, the UCP to lose, you're going to gravitate to, the, to one of those two parties, probably. So it's going to be hard for the, for the Alberta party to figure it out. I really think the opportunity for the Alberta party is probably after the next election when, you know, supporters of the part of the of one of the two parties who lost uh you know are looking for another home or they're saying you know this did the ndp weren't able to defeat the the, the ucp and they say well obviously this isn't working we need to look elsewhere or i'm unhappy and i'm going to go to this other party i just um, remember in the last election the big thing for the alberta party and this is where i want to uh, take us for two seconds here is mm -hmm. the big thing in the alberta party in the last election was we're not jason kenny we're not rachel notley you have the same two leaders in the NDP and the UCP this election, but you're switching them, the government and opposition. Does the Alberta party just run on that? We're not Rachel Notley, we're not uh, uh, Jason Kenney, or like you said, because we are now a two-party system, sort of where Saskatchewan went in 20, 2004, if I'm not mistaken, they went to just the NDP and the Saskatchewan party. Does the Alberta party officially just sort of have to say, we're neither one, so you have to vote for us and the other sort of parties, the liberals, the communists, the wild rose independents, they're 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 not gonna get in. We kind of are the third party alternative now, and we have to sort of stake our claim as the alternative to the major two parties. Yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not suggesting the Alberta party give up. I'm just <laughs> saying it's I'm just saying it's gonna be really hard, yeah. which I think they probably are they probably already realize. Um uh and I'm you know things can change, things can happen. You know, there's, there's potential. I mean, I don't know where, where Barry Murshida is going to run in the next election. He's was the mayor of Brooks. So I, I would assume he's going to run in Brooks medicine hat. That's going to be a tough riding. That is a very conservative part of the province. Um, and I don't imagine, you know, I mean, Brooks is, I mean, Brooks is a decent sized city. It's a, but it's still a conservative place. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's looking at the map. I just, it, it looks like it's, it, it, it would be a very hard place for an Alberta party candidate to, to get elected, even, even a former mayor, even a former mayor of Brooks. Do, um, do the Liberals come out of this, come into this year looking good? Because uh, I, I think it was in a newsletter that they announced that there was yeah. going to be a uh, leadership race in 2022, not a press release, a newsletter to their party supporters. Hey, this is what's happening, but we're not sure when. We're just going to say that there's going to be one this year. Of course, you need to have a leadership race, but the Liberals are sort of, since David Kahn left, floundering, aren't they? Oh, they're almost non-existent. Um, like really, I think there's about six people. Well, there are, and I, and I say, I, I, yeah, and I don't, you know, I, I used to way back in the day, I used to work for the Liberal Party. I actually started getting involved in Alberta politics uh, through the Alberta Liberal Party, and uh, was involved and was on staff when Kevin Taft was was leader when the party was official opposition in kind of the early and mid 2000s. Um, but the the current party is just an absolute complete shell of what it was. Um, you know, maybe they'll have someone interesting run for their run, run for their leadership. I'm, I'm not, I don't like to dissuade people to run for running for politics, but uh, you know, it's, it's going to be, it will be a very hard sell to convince, you know, to, it'd be a very hard time to, uh, to elect a liberal MLA, I think in Alberta and in the, uh, in the foreseeable future. I mean, the the voter coalition that the liberals had, that kind of like 25 to 30 percent of, of the voter pool. Um, I mean, part of it was a, you know, part of it was liberal support, part of it was a default opposition support. If you, you know, if you didn't support the progressive conservatives, you're probably going to vote liberal because they were the they were the alternative, they were the opposition, even if it didn't look like they were going to win or they probably had no chance at winning. Um, there was a, a comment that um uh, John Santos, who's a, a, a researcher pollster in, in Calgary, made. Um, I'm, I'm giving him. I'm totally giving him credit for this comment because it was good. Uh, I thought quite insightful. Um, he said a number of years ago that the Liberal Party, at its end, like when it started to decline before the Wild Rose ro rose to official opposition opposition status, was less of a Liberal Party and more of a coalition of independents. And you had very strong personalities like Laurie Blakeman or. 
um, Hugh McDonald and David Swan and Dave Taylor and Kent Hare and Harry Chase and Kevin Taft. So you had all these very strong personalities and who people who were very popular in their writing and very hardworking in their writing, but there was no real, to say that there was a real overall, like it wasn't an ideological based party. It was very much a trying to be the, progress, the next progressive. Yeah. yeah, but trying to be the next progressive conservative coalition kind of thing. They were trying to rec recreate that rather than being a, a kind of an ideologically based party like the NDP was, even though the NDP is very much more of a, I call it a, a center left ish party at this point. Um, you know, their roots are in social democracy or in socialism when you go back decades ago. The yeah. <laughs> while while Brian Jean is the internal thorn in Jason Kenney's side, the rise of Paul Hidman and the Wild Rose Independence Party is got to be another concern for him. And the Wild Rose Independence Party, they are making traction across this province, and they seem to be making some hay. And they while they are, their fundraising numbers are going to come out here on February first. I can imagine that. Jason Kenney's got to be worried about his right flank as well compared to his left flank with Jason, uh, with Brian Jean. Where does the Wild Rose Independence Party stand in this year? Because if they do well, even if they pull 10% of the vote in the by-election up in Fort McMurray, that's going to be worrisome for Jason Kenney and mm -hmm. everyone, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, when I talk to conservatives in Calgary, they're worried about the NDP. When I talk to conservatives, including conservative MLAs in rural Alberta, they're worried about the Wilders Independence Party or some kind of iterate, some kind of yeah. populist right wing party, not necessarily the Wilders, but something because there is, there is, uh, people are unhappy, and they don't know where to put their vote, but they're not happy with the UCP. And the and, uh, individual M MLAs hear about this. Um, and they're worried that there's going to be a, a kind of a populist protest party. And it looks like the Wilders Independence Party is trying to position themselves, uh, position themselves with that they are a separatist party. Um, but they also talk a lot about uh, you know, anti-vax issues and anti-COVID, anti-vaccine passports and, and a lot of the kind of traditional, um, on top of that, a lot of kind of the traditional right-wing um, uh, issues that get people, that get, that get a lot of, uh, get a lot of people going. So, you know, I think that they could potentially in some rural areas um, worry some conservative MLAs, we worry some UCP MLAs. Um, I don't know. It'd be, really, it'd be really interesting to see how they do in the Fort McMurray Lack the Bish by-election with Paul Hinman, who is also another former Wild Rose MLA, uh, another former Wild Rose leader, I should say, <laughs> yeah. uh, running running uh, against uh, against Brian Jean. It's such a strange dynamic because in in the by-election in Fort McMurray Lack the Bish, because I mean Brian Jean is the UCB candidate, but he's running against Jason Kenney, and then you also have you know the NDP's running a candidate in, in Ariana Man Man Mancini, who I've told I'm told is out door knocking and doing doing what she needs to do. But um, you know, I mean, it's going to be the NDP are definitely the underdog in this race. That is not a natural NDP and orange riding. Um, but you know, well, well if, even in if, the last by election that when Brian Jean resigned and then yeah. Lula Goodridge, they did well, but like you said, it wasn't yeah. a anticipated NDP pickup in that riding. Yeah, and I think it's a different, I mean, Fort McMurray, you know, I mean, Lac La Biche, I think in that area tends to be more kind of traditional, what would fall into what I would describe more of a traditional rural Alberta area, but Fort McMurray is, is a very different kind of community. It is, I mean, it's different. It's not a traditional rural Alberta community. It's not even really a traditional Northern Alberta community. It's, you know, it's a place where people, there's lots of people from everywhere who are there. And even, even though the economy has been fantastic, there are a lot of people who stayed and made, made Fort McMurray their home. And there's a lot of, you know, very interesting dynamics, and especially with uh, being, I mean, being Northern Alberta, there's, there's big First Nations communities, big Métis communities. It's, it's a, it's not a, this is not a monoculture. Um, so even, even if, you know, it's, it leans conservative and they elect conservative MPs and they're probably going to elect a UCP MLA in the by-election, um, it's not boring politics. There's a lot of very interesting things happening up, happening up in, up in Fort McMurray. And the Brian Jean dynamic is something that is, uh, that just 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 kind of adds to it and it makes it even I'd say even of a less traditional election I think if uh, or less traditional by election I think if if Jason Kenney's chosen candidate Joshua Gogo had won the nomination the UCP nomination and been chosen as the candidate I don't think I really don't think we'd be spending as much time talking about the Fort Murray Lacklebish by election we're talking about it because Brian Jean is running yep. and everybody's waiting to see what Brian Jean does next because he is unpredictable uh he has a big uh ax to grind with Jason Kenney uh, and he's very public about it and uh, and he's not backing not backing down so we're all kind of waiting to see what uh, what he does next and what happens if he wins
So I'm just conscious of time here. And I have one last question before we do start a wrap up here, uh, Dave. And that is, we are 16 months out of this until this election, well, almost 17 months. What are you looking for in this year? 2022 is going to be an interesting year. Are there candidates? Are there politicians you're going to be watching? Because this is when you're going to see people come out of the pack and say, we're our own person, or who are you looking at for 2022, 2023? Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to say in, in individually. I mean, you, wh- who runs for re-election is going to be interesting. I pay really close attention, attention to candidate nominations. Um, you know, so which UCP MLAs decide they want to run for re-election. A lot of them were elected on a big wave in, in 2019. Some of them, if, you know, if, if, if things handed in the head in the current, tra- current trajectory, some of them are going to have a really tough re-election at, on their, on their hands coming up in 2023. Um, that it says if the election's in 2023, maybe they'll call it in 2022. Who knows? I just keep that, just put that on the, on and keep that in, in the back of your mind. Um, but you know, there's going to be some MLAs who who will who are looking at the polls and they're looking at you know what they're hearing from their constituents and they might feel that it's going to be a tough race and they might think you know what, one term is good for me. I serve my community. I got to be an MLA. I got to go to the legislature. Uh, even in some cases, you know, I got to be a cabinet minister. That you know, that's great. I'm, I've lived the first the first line of my obituary. That's great. I'm going to retire and you know and walk away and not you know, walk away undefeated. And uh, and people will re- will remember me not as the guy who got defeated. Or the or the woman who had defeated. So I think there'll be a bit of a bit of that, um, and then there might you know there might be some who just retire because they reach an age where they want to, like legitimately just spend more time more time with their family with their friends and family. Um, I'm going to so answer I'm, this this question a little bit here too because sure, I, okay. I want to put this on the I, I've, here. I, I I tend to like go off on no, which is stuff. great because it would be really crappy if you didn't talk during the podcast <laughs> interview. <laughs> I'm going to be looking at Todd Lowen and Drew Barnes. Oh yeah, that, those, that's good. Those are good ones. Because I, if Brian Jean comes mm-hmm. in, Brian Jean likes Drew Barnes, likes Todd Lowen. They seem to be best friends, the three of them. If Jason Kenny wins this uh, leadership review, I, I, I can see these three getting together and being really chummy chummy and really causing some stirs in the UCP caucus and potentially even Leela here, because I know there's yeah. been controversy around there and Angela Pitt. Those, those are my, yeah. the, the wild roses. I'd, I'd toss Dave Hansen in there too. It's the old wild rose, uh, the old wild rose caucus. And they're, they're uh, you know, they seem to be forming the core of, uh, of the internal descent around, around Kenny. And I know there are a number of other kind of UCP MLAs who were first elected in 2019, who are also part of that group, but um it's going to be very interesting to watch that watch that group. I mean, the Wild Rose Party before I mean before it merged with these with the PCs to form the USP, they were like notoriously unruly. Um, you know, they didn't like they didn't like central party leadership. They didn't like to be told what to do. Um, you know, it was it, they were kind of constantly uncoordinated in weird ways and and resistant of of you know main messages and resistant of resistant of being of being you know too controlled from from a from a party central and and i think that's kind of the dynamic whereas jason kenny comes from ottawa and comes from the federal conservatives and he went comes through the harper conservatives. he comes from the harper but he also went through he was a reform party email and he went through that kind of awkward preston manning phase where they were trying to do things differently and it really didn't work and uh, you know and then the whole stockwell day thing and then the harper era which it actually like it really worked for the conservatives. They got a, they got minority governments. They got majority governments, but there was message discipline. There was, you know, lots of control from the center, from the prime minister's office, from the leader. And and I don't think that mashes with the wild the wild rose dynamic. And you see that with I think that's part of the part of the issue with a lot of these uh, these twenty some constituency presidents, are, you know, who are mostly from rural Alberta and um, rural ridings, who are who wrote the letter calling for a, a leadership review to be held earlier than. Uh, I think earlier than March 1st um, and they were denied that. But I think that's, that's part of the dynamic. And I'd like to say that the, everything that the PCs and the wild rose and even the federal conservatives didn't like about each other before the lab, before the two parties merged, that all still exists. They're just all in one party now. And they haven't really had a chance to really, I mean, it's still, a, it's still a new party. The, the, the UCP has only been around since 2017 and you know, they were created to defeat the NDP in 2019, yeah. which they did. They won a big majority. They got a lot of votes. They won big margins in a lot of ridings. Um, but there's all sorts of internal party dynamics that have never really been ironed out. Um, and I think that's part of what you're seeing now. And and part of it is Kenny's style. And part of it is, you know, political influences, you know, from 
political staffers coming from, from all around the province, kind of the same, kind of similar issues to what the NDP had in 2015, where they brought in all these staffers from, from, from across Canada who were really well seasoned in politics, but not necessarily really well seasoned in Alberta politics, which is a unique, we, you know, we're talking about Alberta politics, this is a unique place. There are some things that you can do here or you can't do here that you can do in other, or can't do in other provinces or can't get away with. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's that's part of the dynamic. The, the, the other thing I'm watching, this isn't a person, but this is like the thing that, that defines Alberta politics, you know, almost more than anything else, which is the price of oil. Yeah. So Western Canada Select, that is what I'm watching. WTI, that is what I'm watching um, going in, into the next year. There's indications we're told. I mean, Trevor Tome put out another one of his great graphs the other day that, you know, there's projections that the price of oil is going to go back up by the by the spring. Um you know, we live in a roller coaster in Alberta. We, you know, we, it's our, we live and die on, on the price of oil. Our, so much of the provincial government's revenue stream is based on the price of oil. It's totally unsustainable. It's not a way to, not a way anybody should run anything, uh, but it is the way we run things here in Alberta, um, whether you're a progressive conservative, an NDP or UCP government. And if the price of oil goes back up, um, you know, that, changes the math that could change the math a bit. It could change the dynamic a bit. All of a sudden you're looking at government surpluses. We haven't had government, the government hasn't run a budget surplus in a long time. All of a sudden you're starting to look at that. All of a sudden the government is freed up to start writing big checks. Um, whether that accompanies jobs, whether the price in oil, the increase in the price of oil comes with a job boom is also is something that that will, I think, I think will matter as well. Cause I don't think it's just about money. I think that a lot of Albertans are looking at, you know, that promise that Jason Kenney made. Or a lot of conservatives are looking at that. Well, you know, a lot of Albertans are looking at that promise that Jason Kenney made in 2019 that he's going to bring back prosperity. Um, but it's not just, it's not good enough just to have the price of oil up. The jobs you know, the, that were the big part of the boom have to come back and the well paying jobs. And, you know, we've talked a lot over the past two years about a jobless recovery. And, you know, the, the economy might be doing well, but those high paying jobs might not, might never come back simply because. The world has changed. The, the big oil companies, the big energy companies up north, they've changed the way they've been forced to change the way they've operate, they operate. And a lot of those jobs just, they don't need them anymore. Or they're finished the big construction and the big builds aren't going to happen anymore because they don't need them. So there's all those kind of dynamics that I think will, will, uh, will play into whether Albertans really believe there's an economic recovery. And that's, I think that's a key part of the, of the dynamic of the message that Kenny's trying to push about, you know, things are great. Well, it's great if you can say it in a tweet and it's great if, you know, you can read some news stories about it. But if I don't know, if I, everybody who I know who's been unemployed for the past two or three years is still unemployed, well, then where is the economic recovery? Is this a billionaire's recovery? Which is what we've basically seen during the pandemic is it's, yeah. you know, Bezos and Elon Musk get richer and the rest of us. And go to space with it. Yeah, and go to space, <laughs> you know, like. Where's my jetpack? I want to go to space. Exactly. Anyway, anyway, my last one I want to talk about, and okay. th this is just my prediction. I'm looking at the riding of Lesser Slave Lake with Pat Wren, because mm -hmm. if you remember, and uh, I, the only reason I say this is because I was literally it on ground zero when that letter came out from the municipality of the town of Slave Lake, because I was working there at the time as their communications person. Wild. Well, just, wild. Well, just wild. Okay. Just Sorry, wild. Go on. There during when when pat wren got turf from caucus jason kenny said that he would not be able to run for the ucp ever again does that mm -hmm. mean since he's been readmitted to the ucp he's allowed to run again will he be uh sidelined and say no you can't run the reason i say that and the reason i can say this on the record now because i'm no longer working from them <laughs> is the mayor tyler warman was approached by jason kenny last election prior to Pat Wren becoming the nominee to run in the 2019 provincial campaign. Tyler Warman has political aspirations higher than the mayor of Slave Lake. Uh, he was expected to retire last election, but he ran one more time. I'm expecting him to potentially run for the nomination. He will be the probably UCP candidate in the next election. And where will Danielle Larravee be? Will she run for re-election? Will she stay with the UNA? I don't know. So that's the writing. That's the one writing I'll be watching. And that's the only reason why, because that's, I have yeah. ties to the community. That's, 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 that's really interesting. And it will definitely be one of the ones, one of the ones to watch. Um, I don't think Pat Rain will be the UCP candidate in Lesser Slave Lake in the next election. I, I don't <laughs> think he will be. He up there. Yeah. And, and I think I don't, from what I've, people I've spoken with, I don't think any of the 
I don't feel people feel that any of the issues that were raised in that letter have been resolved since then. And I think him coming back into the ECP caucus was probably more of a move um, to stop uh, an alternative, you know, UCP caucus in exile from forming with um, with Drew Barnes and, and Todd Lowen and whoever else to, <laughs> would uh, would leave to become that for magical fourth MLA that gives you official party status. I think it probably had more to do with, with that than oh, than than you know, the quality of the MLA in, in Lesser Slave Lake. So. Yeah, I think that uh, there'll definitely be a new new MLA. Awesome. Um, Dave, I want to thank you so much for this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. And I just to get again, cautious of time. Uh, last question to you. Uh, your podcast comes out on a regular basis, your show. How can people follow you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Well, for, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. Um, this has been awesome. Um, <laughs> it's been a lot. I love talking about Alberta politics. Um, uh, if people want to check it out, check out uh, daveberta.ca. Um, you can read my blog. Uh, I keep a list of candidates, uh, tracking candidates running in the in the uh, provincial election. Um, uh, you can uh, find Dave Bird. You can find find the Dave Berta podcast at daveberta.ca, or you can search uh, Dave Berta podcast on um, Apple Podcasts, Google Plus, any of your uh, any any podcatcher, where, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find the Dave Berta podcast. Awesome. Uh, for anyone who's listened to the show or seen the show or watched the show before, you know what I'm about to say. Links are in the show notes to Dave's uh, social media pages, to all his uh, podcast pages as well, and his website. Uh, highly recommend you check it out. Dave, greatly appreciate it. And for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep on talking. <laughs>